Good morning. morning. Appreciate everyone coming out this morning. Let us uh, join in and worship our God. Following this song, we'll have our opening prayer. Lord, we come before thee now. At thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not our suit disdain. Shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain? Shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain? Lord, on thee our souls depend in compassion now descend. Fill our hearts with thy rich grace. Tune our lips to sing thy praise. Tune our lips to sing thy praise. In thine own appointed way, now we seek thee, here we stay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful day that you've given us to come out here and assemble to worship your your word. We pray that you help those in there in there help those that are in need and that they may make it to where they want to be spiritually and in physical health. We pray that those in their travels may make it to their destination safely. Thank you for sending your only son to die on the cross for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Following this song, we'll have our Bible reading of the morning. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest, near to the heart of God. Oh, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before near to the heart of God. There is place of comfort sweet near to the heart of God, a place where we our Savior meet near to the heart of God, O Jesus. Blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before 
before thee, near to the heart of God. There is a place of full release, near to the heart of God, a place where all is joy and peace, near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold us to wait before thee, near to the heart of God. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who were, are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when, you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Good morning. good morning. It is good to see each and every one of you this morning. That is right. I mean every one of you. It is truly a blessing, and we are glad that you are here to worship with us and in spirit and in truth, and we are truly glad that God has brought us together. I know that there are a number of worried and concerned about the impending weather. Uh, my response is there will be somewhere between 0 and 85 inches. It may or may not snow. There may be sunshine. There may be rain. But the one thing we have is the Lord's day, and we have today. So regardless of what may happen, we cannot do anything about that. But we can take time to, right now in this moment to be thankful for what God is blessing us with. And that's our time together to worship and to remember how good God is all the time. We are, again, truly blessed. As Brother Henry read for us there from the Beatitudes, the teachings of Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, a series of lessons that we're going to start and to be honest, I, I believe, I think this was the hardest of them for me to comprehend, the first of these Beatitudes. And I hope that that's the case as I continue to study and continue to try to wrap my mind around it. But reminding us of what a Beatitude is. It is a supreme blessedness. It is an exalted happiness. And any of the declarations of blessedness pronounced by Jesus in the Sermon of the, on the Mount these lessons that were brought to us. That's what a beatitude is. And the first beatitude that he mentions here is the one that he refers to as the poor in spirit. Just to read it in exclusively just in its own, it simply says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' teaching and all the things that he did, this is the first thing that he talks about, are blessed are the poor in spirit. And even if we can't wrap our minds around those six words, look at the next part of that verse. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I don't know what your plan is this morning. I can't mention it for you. I can't decipher that for you. I can't even say that that's what I know your mission is. My mission in life, my goal in life, my end reward is that I have the kingdom of heaven. That's what we work for, isn't it? That's what we do our very best as Christians to live our lives day in and day out, to have the great reward of the kingdom of heaven. At the end of our lives, at the end of all mankind, at the end of this world, at the second coming of Jesus, we all long to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. 
Great is your reward. That's what we want. That's what I would hope for. There are a lot of things in life that I would wish would happen for me. There are a lot of things that would be great to happen. It would be wonderful if somebody decided to leave me a million dollars. It'd be great. But as great as that would be, and as rewarding as that would be, and all the things that I could first think that I would do with it, there's no way that I could value that one million dollars more than I could value the kingdom of heaven as my greatest end reward. A free car cannot be greater than the reward of heaven. A beautiful free house, tax-free, no cost the rest of your life, cannot be worth more than the kingdom of heaven. No job, no possession, no earthly wealth could ever be worth more than the kingdom of heaven if we're a Christian. And that's what he's going to talk about when he says, the blessed are the poor in spirit. The humbleness that you find that whatever you have, whatever you're blessed with here on earth, whatever you receive, whatever possessions you have, you consider that minute, nice, thankful, but insignificant compared to the reward of heaven. Do you want to go to heaven this morning? That's a scary sound, the sound of silence when you ask, do you want to go to heaven? Do you want to go to heaven? Do you want that to be your reward? Do you want that to be your ultimate claim in life? I hope that that's our goal together this morning. As we look at what it means to be blessed are the poor in spirit. So that our reward is their reward, which is the kingdom of heaven. Let us go to God in prayer as we begin this morning. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for the beautiful day that you've blessed us with. Father, we thank you for the opportunity of life that we have all had today. Another chance this morning, Lord, to live, to serve, to do your will, to follow your way, to come closer to a knowledge and understanding of who you are. Father, we pray that we'll remove all the outside world distractions right now. Father, we all have valid concerns and worries and wants in our life. But Father, nothing compares with you. You are the great I am. You are the creator of all things. And Father, may we look to you as that way. As we remember that you will forgive us of our sins. You will remember them no more. You will forget the mistakes the sins, the failures, the moments when we are not who we ought to be. Father, that if we come to you with a true, with a true broken heart to want to be like you, to want to follow your way, to want to be in your stay, Father, that you're willing to be just and faithful and forgive us of all those mistakes. Father, we're thankful for a Jesus that loves us and that gave his life for us. We're thankful for a Father that's willing to look past our faults. And Father, we pray that for the next few moments that we'll have our minds focused around your word, your influence, your impact on our lives. Father, we pray that everyone would be able to hear you speak to us through your word. Not listening to the words of myself, but listening to your word. Listening to your words speak to them. And Father, whether they be Christian or a non-Christian, Father, that they'll be obedient to your word today. That they'll find their way to, to take courage, to make the changes they need to make, to step forward and say, Father, I choose you. I choose Jesus over everything else. My fears, my worries, my concerns can all be answered by you, Father. And I can find comfort in you. Let that be our decision this morning. For anyone who's needing your love, your compassion, as we all do, allow them to have the courage, if they need to, to come to you today. And it's in your son's name we do pray. And amen. When you look here at the Beatitudes, and I've mentioned this a couple, well, it's been about a month ago now or more, that I did this introductory lesson to the Beatitudes. You know, there's a lot of things that are very impressive about how Jesus begins this ministry. 
And I wanted to go back and talk about it for just a moment. Luke chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. This meager, this humble beginnings for Jesus Jesus' life begins off not as we would all like to think the king of kings, the lord of lords would begin. He starts off by being born and he has to be laid in a manger because there's no place in the end to, be, to stay. That's the humble beginnings of Jesus. And then you get to Luke chapter 2 verses 46 and following. And after three days they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when the parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Jesus, at the age of 12, going from birth to 12, had people sitting around and astonished. He was asking them questions. They were asking him questions, and they marveled at his wisdom. We have a gap that we don't find filled for almost 18 years. Can you imagine, and I never thought about it until I was preparing this, what did those men who were there who witnessed this do for the next 18 years after they were astonished and amazed at this young man's teaching? This would have been something they more than likely would have gone back to their hometowns and talked with, about, with their neighbors and with their family. I saw a 12-year-old today that changed my, that blew my mind away, completely enthralled. They would have gone back and talked about how this young man marveled them, changed them, blew them away, made them set back in awe of what he knew. And for 18 years... That was an impression that he left upon them. He would have still gone back over the years to go to this feast, to go and do what he needed to do. But the amount of people that left there to go speak about Jesus. What a humble beginning. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 and following. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized. And John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? And Jesus answered him, let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus coming and asking someone else to be a servant to him so that he could begin his servanthood. He says, I need to be baptized by you. Jesus with humble beginnings. Jesus approaching John the Baptist and John the Baptist quarreling almost within himself. I don't need to baptize you. I need to be baptized by you. And immediately we free there, Luke chapter 4, Jesus left full of the Holy Spirit, and returned from the Jordan. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil and he, when he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. He was tempted by Satan for 40 days. And then we read of the temptations that follow him. Jesus, the Son of God, and his humble beginnings, 40 days in the wilderness by himself, being attacked, being came at by Satan, being put under, by being pressed by Satan, by constantly just that, I can imagine in my mind, the rigor that he went through and the forces that he felt and the pain that he went through. Have you ever tried to fast before? They have this thing called intermittent fasting where you try to fast for a certain period of time because it's healthy for you. They want you to do 12 hours, but after 12 hours, the next four hours are the healthy part. If you can go 16 hours... Have you ever willingly went 16 hours without food? I'm a big man. That's miserable. I try. I try to do it for my health. I've tried to do it. I'm impressed by people who can. 
Can you imagine going 40 days with no food? And the weariness that that might place upon you. That's what Jesus did to humble himself. To show how much he loved and cared for each and every one of us. And Jesus returned in power of the spirit to Galilee. And he reported a, and a report about him went out through all of the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues and being glorified by all. Jesus went about teaching. Healing. Helping and encouraging. And that's what brings us to this lesson, this very powerful lesson from Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 5, and in verse 3 Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, what does it mean, blessed are the poor in spirit? Well, I want you to join with me in listening to this. This was written by Albert Barnes and some of the other brethren who worked on this was one of our commentaries from the office. <clears throat> to be poor in spirit is to have a humble opinion of ourselves. To be sensible that we are sinners and have no righteousness of our own. To be willing to be saved only by the rich grace and the mercy of God. To be willing to be where God places us, to bear what he lays on us, to go where he bids us, to die when he commands, to be willing to be in his hands, and to feel that we deserve no favor from him. Let's make that maybe where it's a little bit easier to see and wrap our minds around. It's to have a humble opinion of yourself. The second thing he says is to understand and acknowledge that we are sinners. That I have fault, mistakes, errors. That I've gone against the moral code of God. That I've done things that are against what he wishes. That we are not righteous of our own doing. There's nothing about me that's righteous. I was made in the likeness of God just as you were made in the likeness of God. But we all have what? Sin that's come into our lives. We are saved by God's grace and God's mercy. Nothing that I do. We have to be willing to be where he places us. God is going to use us in ways and give us abilities to do things, but we have to be willing to use what he gives us. As a former teacher, as a band director, nothing was worse to me than seeing a student with all this ability, all this potential, all of this talent, and they wasted it. We have to be willing to go where he sends us. You know, I immediately think of Job as soon as I hear that. Job, go to the city of Nineveh and cry out against them because they are, they, they are vexing me. They are, they, are, they are against everything that I stand. Nope, not knowing it, God. I don't want to. Accept finality of life when he decides. Be willing to do his work. And to feel that God does not owe us anything. I just typed that in. The Google search to find out what it said. What does God owe me? There are a lot of opinions by a lot of people that think God owes them a lot. There really are. There are people out there who think God owes them. We sing that song, Follow Me. And in that song, number 150 in our songbooks, I'm worth a lot to you, God. Don't you see everything I've done? Don't you know who I am? God, don't you see me? But God, through Jesus, his son, in this teaching in Matthew chapter 5, this Sermon on the Mount, he talks about the poor in spirit. And he talks about the humility that you must have. A humble opinion of ourselves. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Matthew chapter 23, verses 11 and 12. If you try to exalt yourself, you try to put yourself on that pedestal, God is going to bring you down. And if you'll humble yourself, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, the poor in spirit, he says you will be exalted. 
Luke chapter 14 and verse 11, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Humble yourself, James chapter 4 and verse 10, before the Lord and he will exalt you. The humbling opinion of yourself is if you'll humble yourself, not think too high and mighty of yourself, not put yourself up on a pedestal, he says, then God will lift you up and theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. That'll be their reward. He says, you've got to be humbled. When he talked to those men there in, at the age of 12, when he was around them, they were wise men. They were teachers. They were priests. They were scribes. They were Pharisees. They were the men of the law and they knew things. Jesus is talking to the blue collar everyday workers. Today, we would call them the middle class or the lower middle class, or we would call them those who are stricken with poverty. He wasn't speaking to the priests. He wasn't speaking to those who thought they were full of themselves. He was reminding everyday people, everyone who was there, follow me. Humble yourself. Don't think too much of yourself. And the second thing he mentions is to understand and acknowledge that we are sinners. Have you ever told somebody how perfect you were before? Seriously. Have you ever told somebody about how flawless you are and how you, you, you need to be more like me? Don't you see? Don't you see how great I am? Don't you see how amazing I am? Well, first of all, that's not humble. That's not humility. That's arrogance. To understand and acknowledge that we are sinners. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, 4. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 6 and then verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in Romans chapter 7 and then verse 24, Paul says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Acknowledging that we're all sinners, that we all have mistakes, that we all have wrongdoings. The second thing it talked about was, or the third thing, I'm sorry, is we are not righteous of our own doing. We see here in Galatians chapter 2 and in verse 16, yet we know that a person is not justified by their works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. We are not, there's nothing that I can do that brings me righteousness for myself. It's through the love and the grace and the mercy of God. It's through the obedience to his word and doing the things that he has asked and commanded. Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 16. And in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. Church, he says, the poor in spirit, the humbled, the ones who acknowledge their sin and understand that they need help, the ones who think that they're not doing it on their own, the ones who understand that the righteousness is not because of what they do, he says theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We are saved by God's grace and mercy. Right, something ever good happened to you on a daily basis and then when something good's happened to you, you're like, oh, hallelujah, praise Jehovah. Things worked out for me. I can't believe it. Things just worked out the right way today. Have you ever sinned and made a mistake and you realize your mistake? And you struggle to forgive yourself? You struggle to forget the thing that you did? You struggle to let go of the error that you made. We are saved by God's grace and God's mercy. And if our Father in heaven is willing to forgive us, shouldn't we be willing to forgive ourselves? If God is all going to allow us through faithful obedience and a contrite spirit and a broken heart to come to him and say, Father, please forgive me. And we know that he has promised that he will give us grace and mercy. Shouldn't we be willing to do the same thing for myself? Shouldn't I be willing to forgive myself, to learn from that, to grow from that? 
we are saved by God's grace and God's mercy. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of our Lord or of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. We believe that through grace we will be saved. Through his mercy we will be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not your own doing, taking that with our previous point that we pointed out, that it's not our own righteousness, nothing that we do. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. I have been saved. I have salvation through the grace and the mercy of God, not because of anything good that I do. We must be willing to be where he places us. And church, that's hard. Because there are often times that we have abilities, we have talents, we have skills, we have the, we have the ability to do these things. And we're like, no. I don't want to take that on. I don't want to do that. Can't somebody else pick up that and do it? Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of acti activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. God places us. God gives us. God shows us. God directs us. God enables us. But sometimes we say, no, don't use me like that. No, don't let me do that. God, please pick something else. Please pick someone else. Sound like Moses to anybody else besides me? I, I'm, not, I'm not eloquent in speech. Lord, I can't do it. God, I can't do it. I'm standing before a bush that's on fire but not burning my shoes are off because it's holy ground, but I'm telling God I can't be used. That magnificent power before Moses, and Moses is still saying, I can't be going to that place, God. You can't send me before Pharaoh. You can't expect me to do that. When are we going to start having faith that the God of all creation has given us each a place to be, to do a work that he has enabled us to do, that we have the skills and talents provided by him if we will only allow him to be willing to use us where he places us? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. We are all members of the same body. We all have somewhere that he places us to do good work. Will we allow him to work through us? Because those are the ones, the poor in spirit, that will receive the kingdom of heaven. To go where he sends us. To go where he wants me to go. It's hard sometimes to go where you don't want to go. Sometimes we get forced in going places that we don't want to go. Sometimes we feel like we're forced to do things we don't want to do. Look at what it says in the scripture. And he said to them all, or said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He's going to send us somewhere to do a work of his choosing. It takes a lot of humility to go where somebody else wants you to go when you don't want to. But are you willing to go where he sends you? My sheep hear my voice, he says in John chapter 10 and verse 27, and I know them. My sheep follow me. Because he's never going to send us anywhere alone, is he? God's never going to put us somewhere to be left alone by ourselves without him right there. God's never going to give me more than I can handle. God's never going to tempt me with anything because God cannot be tempted. God's not going to put me in a situation that he's not going to be right there with me each step of the way. We see that time and time again in scripture. He says, my sheep hear my voice. They listen to where I want them to go and where I want them to be. And they know and I know them and they follow me. They go where I go. God will never send us anywhere by ourselves. Jesus is never leaving us alone. We may leave him 
but God has never left us. And then Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He says, go. Will you go where God sends you to do what God has enabled you to do, to God has talented you to do? Are you poor enough in spirit that you'll humble yourself? Accepting finality of life when he decides. Sister Katie and I talked been a week or two ago. And it feels like there's been a lot of death around the doors lately. A lot of good people. A lot of faithful Christians. And it's hard to accept. But I remember the words of a dear sister telling me it's a celebration of life. We should be happy that God has decided it's time for us to come home. God sees that we have done the best that we can. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a town and such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for just a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or do that. If it's God's will, letting, him, letting us know when he decides and being willing to do his work, church. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. He says you need to be willing to do what I've done for you. And Jesus, in all humility, did things that some of us would not want to do. He's asked us to do maybe things that are challenging, things that are not the exciting things, things that don't draw the attention. It's the down and dirty work. Sometimes there, you know, people think all the time, well, there's not dirty work in the church. There's always dirty work in the church. There's always those things that need done for God's work. Maybe it's a going and visiting people in situations or in neighborhoods that aren't what we feel comfortable in. I will tell you, for six months, I worked with a, with a homeless shelter. For six months, I worked with those who didn't have a home, who didn't have a place to stay. And that is a place that I never thought that I would ever find myself walking into. First of all, church, it was one of the most humbling experiences of my life. Second of all, people who live in homeless shelters are not always there because of their own doing. They haven't made poor decisions. They have just had poor outcomes and poor circumstances sometimes. One of the greatest servant works that I've ever seen were the people who work those and that run those. Sometimes doing the Lord's work isn't the glorious Doing God's work sometimes means going to do things that we would not normally do so that we learn what it means to be a true servant. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. He says, be steadfast, be immovable, always be doing the work of the Lord. What you're doing for God is not going unseen. God is aware and God sees it. So I want you to think about this last one. To feel that God does not know owe us anything. Look at this text with me. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good 
and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. God gives blessings to everyone. God blesses all of our lives each and every day. God doesn't owe us anything. And the way I know that God doesn't owe me anything is because God already gave something that I don't think I could give for anyone. I don't think I could give. I love, but I don't know that if I was ever placed in that position that I could give like God. See, God gave us one gift that's greater than any gift that anyone could ever give, in my personal opinion. And I don't know that I could do it. I'm just being honest. But God doesn't owe us anything. But look what God, who doesn't owe us anything, gave us. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I don't know that I could give one of my children for someone that I loved. If you asked me, Ernie, would you be willing to give one of your children his life to save your mother's life? I don't know that I could do that. I don't think my mom would want me to do that. If someone looked at me and they said, Ernie, you have to choose. Give one of your children for your wife's life. I don't know that my wife would want me to do that. To give one of my children for someone who hates me, who's bitter to me, who's mean to me, who despises me, who makes fun of me, who is hateful. How can I in my mind say, let me give you my child? He says, to feel that God does not, God doesn't owe me a single thing, but God gave his son for me, a wretched sinner, me, a mistake maker, me, someone who falls short, who's imperfect, who has mistakes, who has failures in life. And he still said, Ernie, you're, you're worth my son. Travis, you're worth my son. Connor, you're worth my son. Henry, you're worth my only child. That's how much God, who doesn't owe me anything, has already given for me. He says, be humble. Understand how much God loves you. These are the nine points that we've gone on in this lesson. And I'm right on time. Nine things that I believe do a wonderful job of explaining what the poor in spirit are. A humble opinion of yourself. To understand and acknowledge we are sinners. We are not righteous of our own doing. We are saved by God's grace and mercy. We must be willing to be where he places us and go where he sends us and accept life and the finality of what it is and to be willing to do his work, to feel that God does not owe me anything. Those are the people who are poor in spirit. Blessed, happy are those who humble themselves to understand the mighty power of God and the majesty of God, and how much bigger he is than any earthly possession you could ever have, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Church, that's the poor in spirit, that I don't caught up on the worldliness. I'm willing to give any of this for God. The rich young ruler, what does he say? Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Make yourself poor in spirit. Be blessed. Be happy that you're meeting their needs, that you're taking care of them, that you're not caught up on the worldly things. And he says, and follow me. Who's going to walk out of here this morning like the rich young ruler and go away because you have many possessions and you're not willing to be humbled for God? Are you listening? That's a hard thing to do to be willing to give it all to God. Church, I'm being honest, I don't know if I could do what God asked when God said, I gave my son. This is the first lesson that Jesus taught in his Sermon on the Mount. Are you listening? To be like Jesus, we gotta humble ourselves. We have to have humility in his word, in this world. We have to see that if we want the kingdom of heaven, that we must be humble. And sometimes it's hard to be humble, isn't it? It's hard to humble yourself.
This morning, someone may need to make a change. Maybe a Christian, maybe a non-Christian. Maybe someone who needs to put Jesus first in their life instead of putting Jesus on the back burner and saying, I'll wait, I'll get to you eventually. I, I understand Jesus, but right now is not a good time for me. I got other things that I need to do. Will you put Jesus first today? Will you allow the Lord and Savior of your life, of your soul, the rewarder of heaven, the most amazing gift giver that we've ever known, will you allow him today to be your king? If you're not a Christian, will you be obedient? Will you put him on in baptism? Will you love him like he has only loved you? Will you follow him? And this morning, if you're a brother or sister in Christ, a child of God, who the world has got a hold of, there will be no judgment, but there will be great rejoicing in heaven, and there will be great rejoicing within our congregation. Won't you come while we stand and while we sing? this song, we'll, uh, Ivan will lead us in the uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper. If you uh, did not pick up the emblems, if you'll raise your hand, Edward will uh, see that you get them before Ivan comes to the Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim, hallelujah, what a Lamp 
of God was he, full atonement can it be, hallelujah, what a Savior, lifted up was he to Salted high, hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransom home to bring, then a new song will sing hallelujah what a Today, we live a life of luxury here in the United States. Things don't always go the way we plan them. For me, I work on my car. And I go out and I raise a hood and I look at it. There's not much room there and I say to myself, you know, the engineer that built this doesn't have to work on these. I just can't, can't get, he didn't give me room to get it right. As God created the world, we find in Ephesians, first chapter, that he had to plan for this world when he created it. He knew it was a possibility of corruption. He knew, he knew that he needed a way to repair it. So he sent Jesus. He planned for Jesus to come before he created this world. I don't know why that he did it in the way of sacrifices. That's one of the things that God didn't tell us. But he, from the beginning, he's required man to make a sacrifice so that when he made his, we could understand what a sacrifice was. Jesus, when he came, he came to be that sacrifice. He left heaven to do it. He wanted us to understand exactly what Jesus was doing when he died upon the cross. As Jesus was preparing for the cross, before his crucifixion, he instituted this supper so that we would understand that he is our savior. He had left us this memorial, the bread and the fruit of the vine in representation of his body and his blood that he gave in that sacrifice. We'll partake of the bread now, remembering his body upon the cross. Let us bow. Our Father, we come before you thanking you for Jesus. Father, you've given us the Bible to explain what a sacrifice is so that we can understand, Father, how great was his sacrifice so that we could be servants of yours, that we could worship you. And Father, we have that hope with you in heaven. Be with us now for we take of this bread in memory of his body. Amen.
And now let us bow and give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Our Father, thinking of Jesus and his sacrifice, of the blood that was his life, Father, how that he gave it for us. We partake of this fruit of the vine, Father, in memory of his blood. Be with us now as we partake of it. In Jesus' name we come before you. Amen. As we're worshiping God here this morning, we read in the scriptures how the early disciples of Jesus gave of what they had. Some sold houses. Some just brought money. But they brought it for the use of the church, how it was needed. We find that it was to be used for helping other Christians. James tells us to do good to everybody, but especially those in the church. We find us to be used for those that preach the gospel. God tells us that the oxen were permitted to eat of the grain that they were threshing for the people. This morning, We have an opportunity to give here at Little Hawking. We have a collection basket in the hallway. If you haven't already, you can put anything that you wish to distribute money-wise in that box. Let us bow now, thanking God for the life that we have. Our Father, we come realizing that you are our creator. Father, that you deserve our worship, Father, that we need to understand how we can be poor of spirit. Father, be with us as we enumerate our blessings in life, as we think what we have, how much more we have sometimes, Father, than our neighbor. Be with us, Father, as we give you this money this day. Help us to always strive to please you we give in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning visiting you with us, your honored guests. We invite you back at any time. You have to, to be back here with us to worship our Lord. News and announcements um, on the prayer list. Uh, be with Steve and Robin DeWitt, friends of Rita Kills, struggling with multiple health problems, including COVID, and Robin uh, also has dementia. Uh, Jean Weigel, Edward Kill, is the grandmother of one of Edward's classmates, passed away, please keep their family in your prayers. Uh, Becky Treadway, having to see an orthopedic doctor for an issue with her knee. Uh, Janet Abbott, uh, Nicole Hennon's mother, um, upcoming surgery. Jan Sisko, uh, Mabel Cox, David Eaton, Don Gerber, uh, Ruth and Gary Brown. And you remember Denver and Deborah Horn, uh, Rita Kale and the things that she's got going on uh, coming up. Uh, Harold Morrison, Damon Miller, David Newberry, Charlotte Nestor, and Dana Rose. Those battling cancer, continue to remember uh, Caitlin Dugan, uh, Junior Fleet, Betty Harris, Michael Ann Harris, Chris Hickerson, Harry Miller, Tim Parsons, and Rose Warden. Sick and shut ins. Continue to remember Peggy Allman, Terry and Irene Boop, Sandra Collins, David and Rosemary Eaton, Harry Miller and Rose Warden. Um, Today um, at 
3 p.m. at the Lubeck Church of Christ will be the this year's area-wide worship. Barlow Vincent will be um, hosting this worship service. And again, that's uh, today at 3 p.m. Um, this is Eva Cal's sister, Pat Brownrig. Continue to remember her, remember her in, your, in our prayers. It was requested. And then we have a card here um, from Amy Rogers and Sharon Luce. It says, thank you for be, being a blessing. Thank you for the beautiful arrangements for Lois's funeral. The church was a huge part of her life, and she loved being accepted and loved by the congregation. Thanks to everyone for the prayers and love showered upon her um, over the years. Is there any other, um, anything else needs to be announced for sick or anything? Just remember Sunday evening services uh, tonight at 5 p.m. here at the building. And again, our Wednesday Bible study at 7 p.m. And then in case of in inclement weather, since we're supposed to get a bunch of snow today, um, uh, we will cancel services when the Washington County Sheriff's Office sets a level two or three emergency. Um, for Sunday a.m. services, decision to cancel will be based on information at 8 p.m. on Saturday. A robocall will be made at that time. If levels are set after 8 p.m. on Saturday, the robocall will be made at 8 a.m. on Sunday morning. For Sunday p.m. services, decision to cancel will be based on the information at 2 p.m. A robo call will be made at that time. For Wednesday Bible study, study the decision to cancel will be based on the information at 4 p.m. And a robo call will be uh, made at that time. All right, if there's no other announcements, before we dismiss the classes, we'll have our prayer and then we'll have a closing song. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your, this day you've given us, to, another day to be able to come here this first day of the week to worship you, sing praises to your name, and just pray that the things we've done here this morning were pleasing in your sight. And just pray that as we're here that we can uh, worship you in spirit and in truth, and we thank you so much for the fellowship that we have here uh, it's a blessing to come here uh, each Sunday and, and any time that we have throughout the week to be here to get encouragement and to um, uplift us so we can persevere through each week. We thank you now for the blessings that you give us. We pray that you be with each of those that were mentioned on the sick, li on the sick list and, and on the prayer list. And just pray that you continue to be with those who have lost loved ones and just pray that we can be a comfort to them in, in this uh, struggling time for them. We ask you now to be with us as we go to our classes. Just pray that we can uh, be listen and apply the things we learned this morning and to our lives. And just pray that we can be that light uh, to those we come in contact with for you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. Earth, it sounds like music in mine ears, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love, 
who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. You're dismissed.